10,000 baby crabs, one dying bay, and a gamble that scientists thought had maybe a 30% chance of working. What happened next wasn't just unexpected, it rewrote the rules on how we fix broken ecosystems. Keep watching. A watery gold mine stretching 200 miles from Maryland down through Virginia, covering roughly 4,480 square miles of surface area. That's bigger than the entire state of Delaware. For centuries, this estuary minus fancy word for where rivers meet the ocean. We're talking mountains of shellfish, literal boatloads. Watermen were pulling 20 million bushels of oysters out of the bay every single year. 20 million. To put that in perspective, that's enough oysters to fill the U.S. Capitol building twice. But by 2012, something had gone catastrophically wrong. The bay that once fed millions had turned into what scientists politely called an aquatic dead zone. Translation, the water was so toxic that fish were literally swimming away to die somewhere else. Oxygen levels had crashed. The bottom of the bay had become a graveyard, and the blue crab population, ein. The bay's signature species, the thing Maryland literally puts on its flag, had collapsed by over 70%. So when Virginia's Marine Resources Commission announced they were dumping 10,000 juvenile blue crabs into one of the most polluted sections of the bay, people thought they'd lost their minds. You don't throw crabs into toxic water and expect them to fix anything. That's like trying to clean your house by releasing a thousand hamsters. It sounds insane. Until it worked. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. To understand why this crazy plan succeeded, you need to understand what killed the Chesapeake in the first place. And trust me, it's worse than you think. The Chesapeake Bay is fed by over 150 rivers and streams, draining parts of six states. New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia and West Virginia all dump their water here. Everything that happens in those states eventually flows into the bay. Every farm, every factory, every sewage treatment plant, every suburban lawn drenched in fertilizer, it all ends up here. Starting in the 1950s, industrial farming exploded across the mid-Atlantic. Chicken farms in Delaware and Maryland, massive corn and soybean operations in Pennsylvania. These weren't your grandpa's farms. We're talking industrial-scale agriculture pumping millions of pounds of nitrogen and phosphorus into the soil every year. Fertilizer. The stuff that makes crops grow like crazy. Here's the problem. Plants only absorb maybe 40 to 60% of the fertilizer you dump on them. The rest? It runs off. Into streams. Into rivers. Into the bay. And when nitrogen and phosphorus hit water, they don't just disappear. They supercharge algae growth. Algae blooms sound harmless, right? Algae are plants. Plants are good. Wrong. When algae blooms die, they sink to the bottom and decompose. And decomposition requires oxygen. Lots of it, so much oxygen that there's none left for anything else. The bottom of the bay becomes what scientists call hypoxic. Less than 2 milligrams of oxygen per liter of water. For comparison, fish need at least 3 to survive comfortably. Crabs need even more. By the early 2000s, dead zones were appearing every summer like clockwork. Zones where literally nothing could live. Some of these dead zones stretched for miles. Imagine swimming in water so depleted of oxygen that your lungs couldn't extract anything from it. That's what every creature in those zones was experiencing. They either fled or suffocated. But the fertilizer wasn't acting alone. Sewage treatment plants were dumping partially treated wastewater into the bay. Urban runoff from cities like Baltimore and Washington, D.C. carried motor oil, heavy metals, and trash. Sediment from construction sites clouded the water, blocking sunlight from reaching underwater grasses that crabs and fish depended on for shelter. The bay was getting hit from every angle. And then there were the oysters. Or rather, the lack of them. Remember those 20 million bushels a year? The harvest had dropped to less than 200,000 bushels, a 99% collapse. Why does this matter? Because oysters are nature's water filters. One adult oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water per day. They eat the algae. They clear the water. They create habitat for other species. Losing the oysters was like removing the bay's kidneys. Nothing was cleaning the water anymore. Blue crabs were next in line for extinction. These aren't just any crabs. Colonectes sapidus, Latin for beautiful swimmer. And they are beautiful. 
in a spiky, aggressive, will absolutely pinch your finger off kind of way. Bright blue claws on the males, reddish orange claw tips on the females. They're the bay's apex predator, eating everything from small fish to dead matter on the bottom. They're also a $300 million industry. Crab cakes, crab imperial, steamed crabs covered in old bay seasoning. That's culture, that's identity. But by 2012, juvenile crab survival rates had plummeted. The grasses where baby crabs hide from predators, gone, covered in algae or choked out by sediment. The oxygen-rich waters they needed, dead zones. The food sources they depended on, depleted. Female crabs weren't producing as many eggs. The eggs that did hatch weren't surviving to adulthood. The entire life cycle was breaking down. That's when Dr. Anson Hines from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center proposed something radical. What if, instead of trying to fix the water first and then hoping crabs would return, we reverse the order? What if we flooded the bay with juvenile crabs and let them help fix the ecosystem? The logic was actually brilliant. Blue crabs are what ecologists call a keystone species. They're not the biggest or most numerous creature in their habitat, but they hold the whole system together. Crabs eat dying fish and decomposing matter, recycling nutrients before they can fuel algae blooms. They prey on species that would otherwise overpopulate. They churn sediment, aerating the bottom. They're like the janitors, security guards and maintenance crew of the bay all rolled into one. But the criticism was immediate and loud. You're going to take 10,000 baby crabs, creatures that already have maybe a 5% survival rate in healthy water, and throw them into toxic sludge? That's not restoration. That's crab murder with extra steps. Dr. Hines had a counterargument. The crabs they were releasing weren't normal juveniles. They were late-stage juveniles, almost adults, past the most vulnerable part of their life cycle. They'd been raised in controlled hatcheries, fed optimal diets, protected from predators. These weren't weak crabs. These were crab super soldiers. The release site was carefully chosen. The Lafayette River, a small tributary on Virginia's side of the bay. It was polluted, yes, but not catastrophically so. It had decent salinity levels and some remaining underwater grass beds. If the crabs were going to survive anywhere, it would be here. On a humid morning in June 2012, researchers loaded 10,000 juvenile blue crabs onto boats and motored out to the release points. Each crab was measured, tagged with a tiny marker, and released into the murky water. Then the waiting began. The first week was tense. Had the crabs immediately fled to healthier water? Had they died? Researchers set out crab pots and waited. When they pulled up the first pot three days later and found marked crabs inside, alive and active. The mood shifted from pessimistic to cautiously optimistic. Two weeks in, something unexpected happened. Underwater cameras set up to monitor the release zone showed the crabs behaving territorially. They were defending small areas of the river bottom, fighting off other crabs, establishing themselves. They weren't just surviving, they were thriving. Water quality sensors started picking up changes, subtle at first a slight uptick in dissolved oxygen levels near the bottom. Less organic matter in the sediment. The crabs were eating everything. Dead fish, decaying plants, algae clumps. They were consuming the fuel that would normally decompose and suck oxygen out of the water. Three months in, the real shock came. Researchers conducting routine surveys found baby crabs, not the ones they'd released. New babies, born in the Lafayette River. The released females had mated, produced eggs, and those eggs had survived. The next generation was already here. But the most dramatic change showed up in the grass beds. Underwater grasses in the Chesapeake are stupidly important. They produce oxygen. They provide nursery habitat for dozens of species. They stabilize sediment. But they'd been declining for decades, choked out by algae blooms and cloudy water. In the Lafayette River, grass coverage had dropped to about 15% of historical levels. Six months after the crab release, grass coverage had increased to 23%. A year later, 31%. The crabs were creating conditions for the grass to recover. They were eating the algae that would have blocked sunlight. They were reducing the organic matter that would have fueled more algae. They were churning sediment, helping grass roots establish. The ecosystem was healing itself. This wasn't a fluke. 
researchers from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science started tracking dozens of variables. Nitrogen levels, phosphorus concentrations, zooplankton populations, fish diversity. Every single metric improved in the release zone compared to control areas where no crabs were added. The mechanism was fascinating. It all comes back to something called a trophic cascade. That's when changes at one level of the food chain ripple through the entire ecosystem. The crabs weren't just eating stuff. They were changing the behavior of other species. Small fish that used to dominate the river bottom started hiding more, which gave other species room to thrive. Worms and clams that were being overeaten suddenly had breathing room. More worms meant more sediment aeration. More clams meant more water filtration. And here's the kicker. The crabs were attracting predators. Larger fish, rays, even small sharks started showing up in the Lafayette River to hunt the crabs. That might sound bad, but it's actually exactly what you want. Predators mean the ecosystem is producing enough food to support higher trophic levels. It means the bay is coming back to life. By 2015, Virginia expanded the program. They released 50,000 more crabs across five different sites. The results were consistent. Every release zone showed improved water quality within six months. Grass beds expanded. Fish populations rebounded. Started recovering too. Maryland got on board in 2016. Even the federal government, usually slower than a drunk turtle when it comes to environmental action, threw money at the program. By 2020, over half a million juvenile crabs had been released across the bay. But this isn't a perfect success story. Let's be clear. The Chesapeake Bay isn't fixed. Dead zones still appear every summer. Algae blooms still happen. Agricultural runoff is still dumping nitrogen and phosphorus into the water. The bay needs way more than crabs to fully recover. What the crab release proved is that you can't just fix one problem and expect the ecosystem to bounce back. You have to rebuild the entire structure from multiple angles. The crabs helped, but they worked because other restoration efforts were happening simultaneously. Maryland and Virginia had spent billions upgrading sewage treatment plants. Pennsylvania implemented stricter agricultural runoff regulations. Oyster restoration projects were reintroducing filter feeders. Grass bed restoration was planting new underwater meadows. Not the solution. They sped up recovery in areas where conditions were already improving. They didn't magically fix pollution. They helped the bay help itself once humans stopped actively destroying it quite so much. There's a lesson here that goes way beyond the Chesapeake. For decades, environmental restoration followed the same pattern. Clean up the pollution first. Remove the toxins. Then wait for nature to recover on its own. Sometimes that works. Often it doesn't. Ecosystems can get stuck in what scientists call an alternative stable state. A broken equilibrium where things stay bad because the creatures that would normally fix the problem aren't there anymore. The Chesapeake crab release flipped that script. Sometimes you need to reintroduce the keystone species first, even into imperfect conditions, and let them drive the recovery. It's riskier. It requires more monitoring. But when it works, it works faster than traditional methods. Other restoration projects are taking notes. In California, researchers are releasing sea otters into degraded kelp forests. In the Gulf of Mexico, they're reintroducing missing fish species to coral reefs. In the Great Lakes, they're bringing back native mussels to filter out invasive species. The Chesapeake showed that strategic reintroduction, done carefully with the right species at the right time, can jumpstart ecosystem recovery. Today, the Chesapeake Bay is better than it was in 2012, but it's still only at about 40% of historical health. The blue crab population has stabilized and even grown slightly. But there's still work to do. Decades of work. Maybe centuries. 10,000 crabs didn't save the Chesapeake Bay. But they proved something that shocked scientists, policymakers, and skeptics. Nature is tougher than we think. Give ecosystems even a small chance, even in damaged conditions, and they'll fight to recover. The bay isn't waiting for humans to fix everything. It's trying to heal itself. It just needed a little help from 10,000 spiky. Blue clawed janitors who eat everything and take no prisoners. And that's the real story. Not that crabs cleaned polluted water, but that sometimes the best way to fix a broken system is to bring back the pieces that made it work in the first place. Then step back and let nature do what it does best survive.